jump aboard. I, I, I'm ready as I can be. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So for those of you that don't know, this is uh, Tanya Jane. And uh, Tanya did her medical school at the Government Medical College of Patiala, and then uh, her residency at Detroit Medical Center, uh, followed by fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona and an advanced uh, fellowship at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and joined the faculty a couple of years ago uh, and heading up our program in myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, and she's here today to talk about her other major interest, uh, which is CAR T cells. And her talk is the cell therapy train, jump aboard or get left behind. So I will uh, let Tanya take it from there. Thank you, John. Um, very happy to be here. Um, so the title today is the cell therapy train, uh, jump aboard or get left behind. Uh, there is a question mark at the end, so please don't miss that. It's not a statement, it's a question, it's a, it's a thought for all of us to think about as we go through um, some, of these, uh, some of these slides. And please tell me if you're seeing the presentation mode or, the, or my mode. We are seeing just your screen, we're not seeing presentation mode. Perfect. So, um, so these are my disclosures. Uh, we will be talking about um, the non-FDA approved use uh, of anakindra and siltuximab for the treatment of CAR-T uh, cell related toxicity. The educational objectives for today will include, we'll talk a little bit about the historical perspective, we'll talk about uh, the toxicity and the management thereof, what keeps us busy on the floor, uh, we'll talk about what the future holds, uh, the opportunities and the challenges, and the work we've been doing at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm gonna start off by introducing uh, a term immune effector cell or IEC. I know we use a lot of acronyms and it gets confusing, uh, but the IEC sort of encompasses a lot of the immune effector cell therapies that we use. Um, so IEC stands for a cell that is differentiated enough and capable enough for modulating or affecting um, an immune response, in this case, specifically against a cancer cell. Out of the various IECs uh, floating around, CAR T cells are probably the most predominant, at least at this time, given the developments and the commercial approvals and so forth, but there are different versions of immune effector cell therapies, many of which are listed on the screen. With that, let's start into the historical perspective. Um, so CAR T cell stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell, which means that uh, we stick this ge genetically modified receptor onto a, to a T cell to make it more antigen specific and cancer cell specific. Uh, the word chimeric or the word chimera, where does that come from? Uh, looks like we're gonna go way back into history here, but the word chimera comes from Greek mythology uh, and represents uh, the fire-breathing monster, which is made of lion in the front part, a uh, body of goat and a tail of the, of the dragon or the serpentine, um, basically representing three different uh, genomes making one organism, making one object. And that is what the CAR or the chimeric antigen receptor does in some ways, uh, that there is uh, an ectodomain or a single chain variable fragment. Uh, there is a transmembrane domain. There's a co-stimulator. There are signaling domains or the endodomains for T cell signaling downstream, all of which get together to make this chimeric antigen receptor. The development or the advances in CAR T cells have happened probably over the last 30 years or so. So the first version of CAR T cell or the first generation CAR T cell was developed in 1990, um, followed by a second generation CAR T a decade later, which is the one that we're currently using for the most part. Um, it was studied in murine models and then um, early human clinical trials, followed by a series of approvals, as you see towards the right part of the screen in the last five years. And that bucket is probably only gonna fill up more and more over the coming years because there are hundreds of clinical trials feeding that. So I introduced the terms first generation, second generation CAR-T. And what does that mean? So the first generation CAR-T was a very basic CAR 
in, in, in its most initial or in its most basic form with an ectodomain, a transmembrane hinge, and an endodomain, which is a three, three, uh, CD3 zeta T cell signaling molecule, which was developed in 1990 by uh, Dr. Zelig Eshar, uh, who's an immunologist in Israel. The, while this was an innovative form of T cell receptor um, and was going to transform into becoming uh, a more useful therapy, this structure itself was not very useful because um, there wasn't enough cell proliferation, there wasn't enough cytotoxicity, and there wasn't enough persistence. So it wasn't, it wasn't an effective product. So they, they fixed this. They recognized that they need more T cell stimulation. So um, researchers at St. Jude and Memorial Sloan Kettering fixed this by adding a, a co-stimulatory domain, uh, which was CD28, and then 41BB was added, which was tested in clinical trials at Memorial Sloan Kettering, as well as University of Pennsylvania, um, leading us to where we are here. And the second generation CAR-Ts are the ones that we're using um, are the ones that are commercially approved at this time. Obviously, we, we never stop, right? So uh, now there are the third generation CAR-Ts where the, both the C28 and 41BB co-stimulatory molecules are used. There is the fourth generation CAR-Ts or the trucks where um, there is an inducible immune modifier which improves the cytotoxicity of the CAR-T cell uh, by adding additional mechanisms of cytotoxicity. So more recently, um, this is not the only first, this is not the first, and this is not the only first case series, but probably a more pivotal one in the recent time. So this was a two patient series that came out of University of Pennsylvania from the first two patients treated with their 4-1-BB CD19 directed CAR T cells for relapse refractory B cell ALL in kids. And uh, there were two patients, the first two patients treated were reported in this report. Uh, Emily Whitehead was one of them. I'm not violating HIPAA here. This is public information and you can Google it and, and find this anywhere. In fact, the website is listed right there. Um, so Emily Whitehead is almost 10 years out of her treatment now, uh, 10 years in May. And uh, th this is kind of where things changed in terms of proving efficacy as well as the feasibility in terms of safety um, of a CAR T cell product. Uh, it wasn't easy uh, because when, CAR, when uh, uh, Emily Whitehead got CAR T cells, um, so there were two patients, as I said, in this series, patient two uh, will, will kind of set aside for now, but patient two is the one who had a response which lasted very briefly. Um, patient one was Emily Whitehead. And when she got CAR T cells, there was a sudden spike in her temperatures. And you know, so she, she started spiking very high fevers, which correlated nicely with, um, with a sudden spike in the serum cytokine levels as well. Uh, this is what we now know as cytokine release, now call as cytokine release syndrome. And uh, we'll jump a little bit into the toxicity piece here of our talk and come, come back to the story. Uh, so we'll start with cytokine release syndrome, which, um, you know, it's not a specific term for CAR T cell toxicity. And as we, all of us know, it's sort of a systemic inflammatory response. And we see that quite often after CAR T cells. Um, it has been fairly well understood that it's mediated by all these uh, bunch of cytokines, most notably IL-6, IL-10, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, leading to capillary leak, hypotension, um, organ uh, toxicity or organ dysfunction, all the things that you expect in a systemic inflammatory response situation. Uh, has been shown several times and in several different ways that uh, higher IL-6 correlates with higher CRS grades. Uh, patients who are treated in the ICU, which is the black triangles versus those who, who do not need ICU, which is the red circles, um, have higher levels of these cytokines, um, all, in, all of them, interferon gamma, IL-6, ferritin, CRP, and so forth. IL-6 is probably the most prominent one uh, at this point because there is an antibody that blocks the IL-6 receptor and hence blocks uh, the IL-6 signaling. Um, the drug is called tocilizumab, uh, which, is, uh, which we use fairly commonly. So going back to a little story there, when um, when Emily Whitehead was, was given CAR T cells and started spiking these high fevers two days later, 
uh, called CRS and uh, had profound hypotension, was on pressors, intubated in the ICU. And uh, from what I read, things didn't, look, uh, things didn't look good at that time. So the clinical trial team was sitting and reviewing and kind of scratching their head what to do. Um, and they were reviewing the cytokine profile, which was being collected as a part of the trial. And it was, you know, she was already on steroids, obviously, which was being used at that time. Uh, but it was also noted that she had very high IL-6 levels. And Carl June, who was sitting in Seattle at that time, uh, again, this is also public information, so I'm not, I'm not violating HIPAA here, I think, uh, who was aware of tocilizumab because of an acquaintance who's on tocilizumab for a medical condition, uh, threw this on the table to use tocilizumab. And this is what happened. So when she got tocilizumab, within 48 hours of that, the fevers resolved, she was off pressors, she was off intubation, um, she was out of the ICU and has done well since that. Uh, the reason I, I like to tell this story is because had someone not allowed the use of tocilizumab at the University of Pennsylvania that day because it wasn't FDA approved at that time or it was just a concept and so forth, uh, there is a very grim chance that Emily Whitehead would have had a successful outcome and there is a very grim chance that we would have been talking about this entire field of immunotherapy today. Um, since then, uh, tocilizumab has been a friend. It was approved alongside of the first uh, CD19 CAR-T approval for BCLALL. It's been used in every trial since then. It's been used in our real-world clinical practice, both for the Yescarda or the Axicaptogene and the T-Sage and Leclucil or the Kimraya products. Um, patients, as you can see, get a decent bit of CRS. Uh, also get a decent bit of grade three, four CRS, especially uh, with the axicaptogene product and the use of tocilizumab is, is not uh, uncommon. Uh, the 60% or 70% number is uh, quite relatable to our practice here at Hopkins as well. So as the use of tocilizumab emerged, uh, the question was, when should we use it? Should we wait for the patients to get very sick and be intubated and on pressors and in the ICU? Or could we do that before, before all of that happens, before all that excitement happens? So Fred Hush did, did this study in BCLALL patients and uh, looked at the use of tocilizumab slightly earlier than sending them to the ICU, uh, which was persistent fevers for 10 hours, hypotension that wasn't responsive to IV fluids, hypoxia that, that required supplement supplemental oxygen. And what they showed was that the severe CRS, which is grade three or higher, was slashed by half without compromising um, rates of neurotoxicity, count recovery, or response. So from this, this was sort of one of the studies that showed that early use of tocilizumab may be early meaning uh, before they go to the ICU. Uh, use of tocilizumab is, is fairly reasonable. And this has kind of been our practice here at Hopkins too. Obviously now we have cohort four data from, from the Zuma trial to suggest um, a fairly early use of tocilizumab without compromising efficacy uh, uh, with the axicaptogene product. This is our uh, Hopkins management algorithm. Uh, as much as I would love to go over it word by word uh, at this meeting, I'm gonna refrain myself from doing that, uh, but it is, it is daunting to read uh, when you have three seconds to make patient decision, but this is stuck on the door of the patient's room when they're admitted. And I do encourage house staff to review this, at least know where what is uh, before they go on metal orange to help uh, with taking care of these patients. Uh, but just to give you a few, um, Indications here, uh, the left part of this speaks to the signs and symptoms and grading of CRS. Uh, then on the further right, there is evaluation and monitoring details. And then we talk about the specific drugs with their doses. Um, tocilizumab mostly for CRS, steroids if needed. And we have recently added Anakindra, which is an IL-1 receptor blocker and siltuximab, which is a direct IL-6 blocker uh, for the use in patients uh, with CRS that is refractory to tocilizumab and steroids. Obviously, we update this as new data emerges and the most recently updated version was earlier this month. Um, actually, last month. Immune effector cell-associated neurotoxicity syndrome. So another acronym, ICANS, um, made, made to sort of encompass 
all the neurotoxicity stuff, all the neurological stuff that we see with any of these effector cells, um, actually we see that with bites to some extent as well. Uh, so it's kind of unique-ish to CAR T cells or to T cell therapies. It's, uh, it can be fairly subtle, can be fairly nonspecific, um, something as simple as tremors, as simple as mild inattention, or as I like to tell the nurses, even as simple as refusing to answer questions uh, during the course of their care. Excuse me. Obviously, the other spectrum of this is something more severe when they are when they could be obtunded or have seizures or be less responsive. Or um, we've also seen hemiparesis um, as a result of the neurotoxicity uh, causing cerebral edema. This is a famous picture uh, that comes from this review that uh, kind of shows the differences in handwriting from the dysgraphia uh, that can occur uh, with neurotoxicity. But the interesting point is that so there's legible handwriting. It becomes not readable, and then it becomes legible again once the, the uh, neurotoxicity resolves. So subtle, specific, uh, needs to be treated, uh, or usually needs to be treated, but is reversible. So it's, it's often uh, fairly discouraging to see a family member uh, going through neurotoxicity, but a lot of re reassurance is important to the family and also to the house staff sometimes. Uh, the mechanism of ICANS as opposed to neurotoxicity is probably less clear. Uh, some thoughts include that there is, this is mediated by the same cytokines which passively diffuse into the CNS. Uh, there is possibly some trafficking of the CAR T cells into the CNS and that has been shown on CSF profiling. Uh, cortical irritation uh, has not been commonly seen. Um, so, um, as the wife of uh, an epileptologist, we have reviewed a lot of these EEGs personally and together, and most of what we have seen is diffuse slowing on EEGs. Um, other people have reported, or one report has reported less than 5% people had non-convulsive status. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, uh, or maybe we just haven't picked them in that window. Uh, our practice at JHS, since I said it's, it can be fairly subtle and difficult to recognize, uh, we do uh, get the ICE scoring or immune effector cell encephalopathy score on these patients um, every day when they come to IPOP, which includes questions about orientation, naming things, following commands, handwriting, and attention. Um, and uh, using that, we, we do their ICANS grading, which is done at least daily in IPOP. Uh, these patients are also on Keppra 500 twice a day at baseline for 30 days following CAR-T for seizure prophylaxis. Uh, so this is our concordant document for neurotoxicity algorithm. Again, similar format with um, grading on the left and treatment considerations or treatment drugs on uh, towards the right, uh, mostly including dexamethasone for neurotoxicity. Tocilizumab is, is not great about going to the brain and, and, and not great about resolving neurotoxicity. So we rely on dexamethasone for the most part. Um, we now have included Anakindra, again, an IL-1 receptor antagonist uh, for management of neurotoxicity. So Tuximab, uh, which is an IL-6 or direct IL-6 blocker, does not seem to have much of a role in neurotoxicity, um, and we're still uh, sort of figuring that out. So as these toxicities were emerging and making clinical practice busy and, and, and whatnot, uh, we had started thinking about how can we predict, how can we identify patients who are at higher risk of toxicities? So some of the things uh, that we did when I was at Sloan Kettering, uh, one of them was we, uh, we uh, looked at modified E6. So E6 is, uh, is, is a fairly uh, described score in the context of transplant and a measure of endothelial damage, um, showing that creatinine and LDH correlate with toxicity directly while platelets do so, or platelet count does so inversely. Uh, the role of creatinine in CAR T cells is not fairly prominent, and we had shown that using our data at Sloan Kettering. Uh, instead, uh, CRP seems to be more directly correlated with, uh, with outcomes in CAR Ts. So we switched creatinine with CRP, making it or calling it um, modified E6, and we, we, we tested or we measured the score at different time points around the CAR T cell treatment. 
um, such as at lymphodepletion, at day minus one, at day plus one, and day plus three. And it seemed to correlate fairly well uh, with severe, uh, with predicting severe uh, CRS. So again, severe meaning grade three or higher CRS at all of these time points. It was uh, less distinguishable for, uh, for neurotoxicity or ICANS, uh, probably a little bit so on day plus three, um, but I think that's related to the fact that, uh, that ICANS is in some ways correlated with CRS and occurs late probably some of the reasons why uh, this early testing may not uh, correlate as well with, uh, with ICANS as opposed to CRS. Another concept we explored uh, was related to antibiotic use and intestinal microbiome. Um, again, in the BMT world, um, this has been uh, more well described in terms of being related to toxicity outcomes, GVH, and so forth. At Hopkins, Dr. Diwali Sharma is looking at the correlations of microbiome with, uh, with the outcomes, especially in breast cancer. So there's definitely some buzz about, uh, uh, about the role of microbiome in, in cancer outcomes, uh, and actually even non-oncological outcomes. So um, we, we, in the CAR T-cell patients, we looked at uh, the use of antibiotics and intestinal microbiome changes that correlate with CAR T outcomes. Um, and uh, one of the things that we showed was that exposure to antibiotics, uh, specifically peptazo or imipenem or meropenem, all of them anaerobic targeting antibiotics, um, exposure to one of these in the 30 days prior to CAR T cell infusion was associated with a lower progression free and overall survival, both with the C28 and the 41BB uh, product. Um, this was not correlated as much with the CRS as shown on the right part of this figure, uh, but, was, uh, but was correlated with neurotoxicity. And, and the CRS neurotoxicity here was just a yes or no. This was not, a, the, the, there was, we didn't grade the toxicity for the purpose of this analysis. Um, subsequently, using uh, the 16S uh, ribosomal RNA sequencing and shotgun sequencing, we looked at the, the diversity or the fecal diversity of the microbiome. Um, and uh, both in the original cohort at MSK and uh, the training or the validation cohort at the University of Pennsylvania, the, the alpha diversity of microbiome in, in, um, in these patients was lower compared to healthy volunteers. And this alpha diversity was correlated with responses at day 100. So patients with higher alpha diversity shown in the red um, had a higher probability of a CR at day 100 compared to patients with lower alpha diversity. Uh, this difference in diversity actually all, did not correlate with neurotoxicity uh, or neurotoxicity or CRS, however, and I, I, don't, know, I don't have those curves here. Uh, so moving that forward, what we're doing here at Hopkins now in collaboration with Dr. Erica Pierce's lab and Dr. Uh, Michael Sanzak, who's a postdoc in her lab, is looking at immune metabolic phenotype of CAR T cells um, to identify immune metabolic biomarkers that could be associated with persistence of these CAR T cells um, and possibly with the efficacy of these CAR T cells. Uh, a similar work was done by Jonathan Powell and, and Andrea Cox in, in uh, COVID-19 patients where they did single cell interrogation of, of the uh, metabolic profiles of, of COVID patients and some other infection uh, or patients with some other infections and showed that there are specific T cell and myeloid depressive, uh, myeloid derived suppressor cell profiles that exist in patients um, with more acute illness or more severe illness compared to those who recover or have a milder illness. And some of these T cell functionings like the BDAC or the caspase can potentially be targeted um, to improve the T cell apoptosis that happens as a result. Um, so kind of suggesting or leading towards our hypothesis that some of these metabolic studies in the, in the CAR T cells that are infused to patients may lead us to some uh, direction in terms of efficacy and potentially even toxicity of CAR T cells in these patients. Um, cartopenia, so it's not an official term, uh, it's just a term that I use in one of the reviews that I recently wrote, uh, but hey, this is a presentation that I made, so uh, I'll do whatever. Uh, so this kind of, uh, kind of refers to cytopenias after CAR T cells, which is not uncommon. In fact, uh, cytopenias after CAR T cells is probably the most common toxicity that we see after, uh, after CAR T cell infusion although it's not as acute and not as exciting on the floor as CRS and neurotoxicity, which is kind of why it fell by the wayside in the, in the, in, in the initial times. 
um, can happen for a variety of reasons at different time points after CAR T cells in the early phases, you can imagine lymphodepletion therapy um, uh, kind of uh, decreases the cell counts, uh, inflammatory storm or the CRS neurotoxicity have been associated with lower cell counts. Uh, we have seen some macrophage activation syndrome kind of pictures or HLH-like pictures after uh, CAR infusions. Infections after CAR T cells are not uncommon um, and uh, kind of follow the BMT uh, pattern in terms of occurrence, uh, which requires us to put them uh, requires us to put them on prophylactic antibiotics for different time points after CAR T cell infusion, but can cause cytopenias in that time frame. Uh, obviously, think about disease relapse, especially if there is known marrow involvement. There have been anecdotal reports of myeloid uh, or myelodysplastic syndrome. As you can imagine, these patients have been treated with multiple lines of cytotoxic therapy before they get CAR T cells, which probably predisposes them to therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. Whether CAR T cells directly have a role in contributing to this is, uh, is unclear at this time, um, and probably longer follow-up on, on these studies um, will, will shed some light on that. So we looked at cardiopenias or, or cytopenias in detail at, uh, during, my, during my fellowship and um, kind of a mixture of products here, including the commercially approved as well as a couple of homegrown products at Sloan Kettering. Uh, but the nadirs are real and mostly grade three and grade four as shown uh, with the yellow and the blue towers on, on, the, on the grading chart on the right. Uh, we then looked at recovery uh, so we don't call this engraftment, contrary to our BMT uh, world, uh, but the hematopoietic recovery does take a while after CAR T cells. So for, for the purpose of this particular study, we defined recovery as a hemoglobin of eight platelets of 50,000 and ANC of 1,000, kind of pertaining to the transfusion requirements and so forth, um, and showed that it takes two to three months for half of these patients to even recover their cell counts. Normalization as the next step uh, takes even longer, as you can imagine, and can take even up to a year. Uh, I usually quote six months to a year for normalization of blood counts to happen. Um, and this is important, especially from the context of um, uh, leading or CAR T's leading to transplant in, in some cases, uh, as is being currently studied. Uh, what we also showed. Um, is that hematopoietic recovery at one month was significantly correlated or associated with CRS or neurotoxicity of grade three or higher. Uh, this was true in the univariate analysis and was also true in a modified multivariable analysis where we adjusted for baseline cytopenias and CAR construct in separate models, mostly due to the smaller sample size, but held true in both of those models. Um, Fred Hutch has, has shown similar results more recently. They just published their data. Um, and CIBMTR is looking into this analysis for axi captagene or Yaskarda product in a larger data set right now. Uh, in our study, we had some serial cytokine levels on the patients treated on the two clinical trials, and uh, we didn't necessarily see a pattern uh, in terms of differences of cytokine levels, although there, was, there may have been some suggestion that some of the growth factor levels and uh, macrophage-derived chemokines may have some correlation with count recovery but we're gonna explore this further in, in our uh, lenzilumab trial, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, most recently, uh, the European and the, and the Moffitt groups got together and uh, came up with a score uh, or a prediction model for hematotoxicity or cardiopenias following uh, uh, CAR T cells, uh, basically included baseline values for blood counts, uh, CRP and ferritin. Interestingly, this is the only study that did not show correlation of CRS and neurotoxicity with count recovery. Um, but nevertheless, the score is done at baseline um, and involves uh, parameters mostly pertaining to pre-existing cytopenias. And they showed that a higher score was, was uh, associated with higher and more prolonged uh, neutropenias and a higher incidence of eclasia after, um, after CAR T cells. All right, so that is what keeps us excited in the clinical field or in the, in the, on the floors and in the clinics. Um, what's moving us along or what, what the future holds, uh, I'm gonna start with, uh, with where we stand right now to kind of just kind of have a starting point. Um, so I have to show you 
some famous responses from Kartisa, right? Because the presentation is otherwise incomplete. So this is one of the figures that, that, was, that comes about, mm -hmm. circulates around quite frequently in the lymphoma world, a patient pictured on the left uh, with multiple relapsed lymphoma, uh, not responding to 60 lines of therapy um, and gets CAR T cells and has a complete remission on day, day 30. Um, and these are the towers, as I like to call, of responses in lymphoma and multiple myeloma. The historical responses are in the green. Um, and while this is not a direct comparison, um, I think the, the response, at least the responses with CAR T cells are encouraging. Whether that translates into improved survival, uh, time will tell. And obviously, the historical curves keep changing with addition of therapies, too. Um, so the dust is yet to settle, but um, reassuring nevertheless. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, commercially approved CAR T cell products for B cell lymphoma, um, Axicaptogene cellulosal or Yescarda, uh, which targets CD19, T cell leclucil or Kimraya, also targets CD19. Uh, Lysocaptogene mar uh, mar cell, which is the Brianzi product, um, uh, is also approved for B cell lymphomas. And then Brexocaptogene or uh, Ticartus is approved for mantle cell lymphoma. And you would see uh, at least encouraging response rates <clears throat> across the board for all of these products. Um, Axicaptogene or Yescarda is what we're using most commonly here for the, for the B cell uh, lymphomas. Um, and while the responses are exciting, uh, there is also a fair bit of neurotoxicity that we see um, and a fair bit of grade three or higher neurotoxicity that we see with this product. Uh, Brexocaptogene or Ticardus is the only product approved for relapsed refractory mantle cell and is also associated with a fair bit of CRS and neurotoxicity. Uh, the Brexocaptogene and Axicaptogene are, are actually very similar or actually the same uh, in terms of structure. It's, it's a bit of a manufacturer. Uh, difference that, that makes it a different product. Commercially approved products for B cell ALL and, and multiple myeloma. Uh, so Brexucaptogene again is approved also for adults for relapsed refractory B cell ALL, uh, while T cell lactosil is approved for kids, well, age under 25 for B, B cell ALL. Uh, and again, you see similar bit of CRS and neurotoxicity. Uh, these are the two relapsed refractory multiple myeloma products uh, that got recently approved. Actually, the Silta cell uh, product just got approved last month um, after four lines of therapy. Uh, while we're waiting to get these on board, and these should be up and running at Hopkins fairly soon, um, what is uh, exciting is their response rates. And what is concerning is some of the Parkinson's-like symptoms that some of the patients have developed, probably related to the... the uh, cross presence of BCMA on some of the basal, basal ganglia tissue um, and is being uh, studied fairly extensively currently to, to ensure safety of these products. So what does the future bring? Uh, there is targets, there is more targets, and there are fewer good or useful targets. Uh, so there's a lot of targets, uh, but there's not a lot of good targets. Uh, so myelar targets being explored right now, CD33, 123, FLIP3, combination of CL, CLL1 and CD33, and it sounds like the myelar cars will probably uh, be a bridge to transplant for the most part from what it looks like. Uh, there's more uh, receptors or more targets being explored in the myeloma world, um, CS1, uh, GP, CR5D. Uh, the CD30 product for Hodgkin's um, has moved along. CD5 for T-cell ALL, uh, uh, Baylor recently published their five patient series. Uh, the dual targeting CAR T-cells uh, with 19 and 22 to address the antigen escape after uh, relapse in ALL. And there are some solid tumor targets being explored uh, in mesothelioma and sarcoma. The reality of this, however, is that that ideal target does not exist. Uh, the ideal target has to have a very high coverage on tumor cells and a very high specificity for tumor cells. Um, ideal target in CAR T cells is probably like that ideal conditioning regimen in BMT, which has enough myeloablation and enough GVL, but has no organ toxicity and no non-relapse mortality and no GVHD. Um, so it's a bit of a myth, uh, but um, it surely is keeping things moving along. All right, so uh, what's around the corner now at this point is moving CAR T cells at least ahead in the, in the line in the sequence of treatments. 
So Zuma 7 is one of the three sort of concomitant trials that happened with the three approved products in lymphoma, comparing the CAR-T product to the current standard of care in second line, which is salvage plus, uh, plus auto, although a bunch of them did not even get to auto. Um, this is, these are figures just for Zuma 7, which as you can see, show um, not much difference in terms of the overall survival, show difference in terms of progression-free survival. The orange curve is an is a axis cell curve. Um, I, would, I would also comment that Belinda trial, which was a similar trial for uh, the TISA cell or the TISA genetically product, was a negative trial uh, and did not have the difference in progression-free survival. And the TRASFORM trial, which is the third one, uh, with uh, lysocaptogene is currently so far positive for progression-free survival, although it's, it has a very short follow-up right now and we're still waiting on the final results. Uh, but based on uh, the Zuma 7 results, it is anticipated that FDA, or FDA is currently considering and it is anticipated that they may approve um, axicaptogene for use in uh, second line for lymphomas, um, whether that's accurate or not uh, is, is, an, is a question for another debate. Um, similar trials or similar efforts are going on in the world of multiple myeloma, moving uh, the use of CAR T cells up in, the, up in the line. They're currently approved after four lines of therapy. Uh, the other challenges and opportunities that, that we'll be addressing in future is, um, is how to mitigate the toxicity of CAR T cells, which um, as I have alluded to earlier, is, um, is, is not trivial. Uh, one of the concepts that interests us uh, or interests me is the GMCSF pathway, which was shown to be involved in uh, CRS and neurotoxicity in, uh, in two elegant studies, one from Italy and one from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, a few years ago and uh, data from, our, uh, from my collaborators at uh, Mayo Clinic Rochester had shown that uh, using GMCSF antibody in mice along with CAR T-cell improves their weight gain and, and uh, thriving after CAR T-cell infusion. And in fact, possibly also improves their cytotoxic abilities after CAR T-cell infusion as shown in the red where uh, the CD19 positive cells remain low on day 35 compared to the blue where the CD19 cells tend to start growing by day 35. Based on this, we have worked uh, with a company that makes a drug called lenzilumab, which is a GMCSF antibody, uh, to look at this in a randomized fashion. It's actually a phase two, phase three trial, um, where we'll eventually compare lenzilumab to placebo in patients getting CD19 CAR T cells for lymphoma with a primary endpoint of toxicity um, and other secondary endpoints, including a response and toxicity-free response. Um, I think we've alluded to this a little bit uh, about the work that we're doing here at Hopkins and others are doing, uh, but a lot of efforts are looking into kind of predicting who will respond and who will have high-grade toxicity um, from CAR T cells, including cytokine patterns, proteomic analysis, um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at the immune metabolic analysis of the infused CAR T cells. Uh, the last section will talk about what we're doing at Hopkins or what we have done at Hopkins. Uh, so for the sake of reference, I uh, started faculty here two and a half or so years ago, and I took this position as, as leading the CAR-T program around that time. Um, and this is kind of the simple vision that, that I had when we started. We uh, recognized that there's a clinical piece of this, there's a research piece of this uh, that needs to be developed over time. Probably the clinical needs to be developed first because without volumes, we're probably not going to be much um, ex existing in the world of CAR T cells. So that is where we started. We developed our standard of care products such that we could attract more volumes, uh, more patient volumes. And that seems to have worked. We have increased our volumes. Um, let's see, we started fairly slow in, in fiscal year 18 and 19 and are cruising our way up uh, with the addition of. Um, the Yascarda product, um, some newer approvals in mantle cell, adult B cell, ALL, um, and with the forthcoming addition of the myeloma product, we expect our volumes to grow even higher in the coming couple of years. Uh, this was made possible by uh, the use of existing transplant resources so far, um, and obviously we're thankful to our transplant team for accommodating this. 
but as the volumes grew, it became evident that uh, we'll need some dedicated resources for CAR T cells to move the prog program along. Um, with the help of uh, Rose and others, we developed uh, uh, the, the management adjustment, which we presented to the JHH leadership last year, which uh, was approved and allows us to hire um, several personnel uh, dedicated to the clinical processes of CAR T cell products, um, including nursing staff, BMT case managers, um, HAT, Phoresis team, CTL team, et cetera. Uh, now thinking about uh, research, so uh, clinical research is where we're currently trying to put some effort in. Uh, the goal is to open, not very ambitious, but at least to open two to three clinical trials in the next year. Um, we were hitting a bottleneck with our research personnel or research resources with regards to that. Um, and we uh, recently presented a research budget to uh, the Cancer Center leadership and uh, were approved to hire three personnel dedicated for CAR T cell research, which we're currently hiring. Um, and then from the basic uh, science standpoint, um, I think I already spoke a little bit about some of the biomarker correlative studies that we're doing in the CAR T world, um, the concepts of toxicity prevention that we'll be pursuing in this space. Um, as far as new products are concerned, um, it's, it's coming along. Uh, Dr. Chalice Bonifant has uh, not a CAR T, but a T cell engager. So it's a CD123 T cell engager that she's developing in collaboration with NIH. Um, I am personally interested in myeloid CAR markers. Uh, so um, after a lot of convincing, the leukemia team seems to be coming around to, to pursue uh, the CD33 CAR trial that I had been um, meaning to pursue for a while. Um, we're working with uh, our collabor collaborators elsewhere to develop some of the MPN specific targets. Um, and uh, with uh, a new functional GMP facility, um, which is supposed to be up and running shortly, uh, we'll probably see more of the homegrown products um, coming out of Hopkins. With that, and a lot of gratitude to all the people who have worked, uh, whose work has been very critical in keeping us aboard the cell therapy train. Uh, I'm gonna end my talk here and uh, happy to take any questions. So uh, Tanya, thank you very much. That was, a, that was a great talk. And I, one of the, you know, I, a couple of questions that I have um, I, I thought the Zuma 7 data was was more compelling than a lot of the prior ALL studies. And I think, you know, doctor, I've talked to Keith Pratts, who now runs the leukemia program at Penn, where they've spent a lot of time developing CAR T cells. And, you know, one of the issues that we have in ALL is we never actually get our patients to CAR T cells. And so the data looks great, um, but, but you, you know, sort of don't, it ignores the 50% of patients or more that, that actually never get the CAR T cell product. And so I'm wondering in the field, if there's, you know, a movement towards uh, trying to more explicitly capture those patients that never get there. Um, and if there are any thoughts in the ALL field about actually doing some, so I, I've heard talk of a ran, a big randomized trial with CAR T cells, but I haven't uh, since uh, seen it comparing it to other available therapies. Yeah, so I think the CAR T cell field was fairly notorious from the beginning, not doing randomized trials, right? I mean, most of the most of the registration studies, interestingly, were single arm studies. Zuma seven or some of these comparative uh, or these comparisons to uh, second line standard of care were probably uh, one of the first randomized trials that we saw in the CAR T space uh, to address. Patients who don't even get to CAR T, I think one of the things to note there is that it's very product dependent. Um, so we definitely see that, and we saw that on the Belinda trial, which, in my opinion, was part, probably a part of the reason why Belinda was a negative trial, while Zuma Seven and Transform are positive trials. You definitely see that more with with Kimraya or T cells and lactose products, at least in lymphoma. Maybe not so much in ALL, but in lymphoma for sure. Um, in Zuma 7, there were very few patients who did not get to CAR T's, although they only used steroids as bridging and transform says bridging, patients who got bridging did worse, but I think that's probably because they're just in fear, uh, in fear of prognosis to begin with. Um, 
So I think that's fairly patient, uh, product and patient dependent. And in terms of ALL, I guess there, there's, there's comparative studies now for both lymphoma and ALL um, in terms of comparing them to uh, the, the standard of care or adding transplant at the end of it, uh, whether patients have a complete response or a partial response. In ALL, I think historically, the role of transplant at the end of the, of the CAR-T has made more sense because uh, no matter what ALL trial you look at, whether it's the MSK product, which is not approved, obviously, um, or the Zuma-3 product, which is Tocardus, which we're using, I think the relapses are not infrequent. And it makes sense to transplant them. Whether everyone needs a transplant, I'm not sure. And that is another, field, another area of investigation to identify or to find ways to uh, predict patients who will relapse. And in fact, I, I missed adding that here, but one of our colleagues, um, one of our fellows, Cole uh, Sterling, is looking, at, um, is looking at some of that in lymphoma as well. Hey, Tanya, can I follow up on the Zuma trial? Um, by the way, uh, very nice talk, and thank you. <clears throat> um, many people, including myself, and occasionally FDA, are skeptical of data that shows progression-free survival uh, advantages and not overall survival advantages. In fact, the overall survival curves are right on top of each other. And this is for a disease that doesn't have a long natural history once it relapses. And I heard the presentation at ASH and there wasn't a lot of granularity there. And I wonder whether um, the reason there's no difference for, is people were getting the CAR T cells after the auto transplant instead of, well, and people failed auto transplants. And maybe um, getting this approved up front may be exactly the wrong thing to do just from a cost situation because auto transplants are about one-tenth the cost of CAR T cells. And if in fact, you can salvage the auto transplant with the CAR T cell, that actually may be the uh, way to go. And, you know, the results so I, of the study may be leading to practice that is gonna bankrupt us. So you, you're saying all the right points and all the points that we have included in our position paper that we're writing on Zuma 7 from ASTCT. Ah, I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's not out yet. It's, it's uh, just submitted. But uh, I guess I, I think those are very reasonable points. Uh, on Zuma 7, uh, so first of all, I think the point to note is that this is not a car versus auto study, right? This is car versus chemoimmunotherapy because there's a substantial page, a percentage of patients in each of these trials that did not even get to auto. On Zuma 7, that was around one third of the patients because they did not even respond to salvage and ended up getting uh, CAR-T standard of care. So, uh, so yes, that is part of the reason of overall survival. I think the cost perspective is something that, that one could spin either way. So if you're uh, totally agree with you that cost of CAR-Ts the way it stands right now at least is almost prohibitive uh, and adding that to the transplant as I always say someone in the financial division is probably having a minor heart attack right now but uh, another way to look at it is if if the progression-free survival is indeed prolonged and you are using less therapies after so the event included using additional therapies after CAR-Ts uh, so if you're using less therapies, which are also not less expensive, at least the newer ones, uh, you may be compromising or you may be sort of making up for some of that extra cost by, by, by improving the progression-free survival. I, I don't deny that this is definitely not one of those straight up approvals and uh, there will be a lot of uh, heated debates once it does get approved and how we use it. Uh, but, and actually Dr. Nina Wagner Johnson recently did a journal club on this a couple of weeks ago with one of her fellows um, addressing some of those points, uh, but it does look like that it, 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 at least in some shape or form, may move forward, whether that's in combination with transplant or not. Tanya, um, just wanted to ask you about uh, one of the points on your slides, and I think it's also uh, relevant to one of the questions that was in the chat room, which is you, you said that one of the goals of CAR T cell therapy is to increase uh, the specificity of the effector cells for the tumor as opposed to normal tissue. But I guess the 800 pound gorilla in the room of CAR T cell therapy is that there are no cell surface markers that reliably distinguish cancer cells from their normal counterparts. So, um, you know, CAR T cells, you know, currently are only 
applicable to uh, tumors of dispensable tissues. So for instance, when you do CAR T cells for uh, B cell lymphoma, a successful therapy is uh, also complicated by profound uh, and durable hypogammaglobulinemia. So I guess I have two questions. One is that uh, it'd be nice to talk about, you know, dealing with the hypogammaglobulinemia, especially in the era, era of COVID. And a uh, second question is, are there any efforts to make uh, CAR T cells applicable to tumors of uh, indispensable tissues? And will it ever be applicable to solid tumors? Yeah, I think those are, those are great points. And um, I don't know if the answer will be CAR T cells themselves or another version of IECs where uh, you may have a target that is either not represented on the surface or expressed on the surface and is potentially more, uh, you're trying to target something more intracellular versus uh, targets that are present elsewhere. And I think one of those debacles was with the PER2 receptor CAR Ts for breast cancer, which where we quickly saw a lot of cardiotoxicity that was, um, that, on, that obviously trashed that idea. So I think using something that is expressed um, at least in the same form on another organ or another tissue, which is, which is not dispensable is, is definitely challenging. And I don't think CAR Ts necessarily will be the answer. The hypogammaglobulinemia. Oh, that, so, that a... so definitely important. And I think we've seen implications of that even before COVID actually. Um, we had a patient who got pretty bad uh, influenza after CAR T cells. And like I said, infections in general are not uncommon after CAR T cells. Um, ID, um, the ID community has pushed for uh, replacement of immunoglobulins uh, for a while, even up to years after. And we do recommend uh, checking them uh, at least every three months up till even after a year and replacing them as needed, especially in people who either have very low levels, less than 200 or have an associated deficiency in IgA or have recurrent infections. A lot of this is derived from the transplant field, as you can, as you can imagine at this time, um, but, but there is definitely a push towards that. Uh, Abbas, you have a question? Abbas. Okay. I think he's playing the April Fool's game. <laughs> we can't hear you, Abbas, so maybe you could put your question in the chat. He disappeared entirely. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat, which I'm not sure I addressed. Um, seeing CAR Ts in solid tumors in the near future. Um, I think there, this is an active area of investigation. Um, the mesothelin target and the, we actually have a sarcoma trial for pediatrics open here at Hopkins. And there are mes mesothelioma trials that are, um, uh, that are being uh, run at uh, Sloan Kettering, although met with some hiccups recently. Uh, but this is definitely an active area of investigation, and uh, I don't think we have the right target there yet. Um, but there's definitely a lot of excitement, not only from the CAR T perspective, but there's a CAR macrophage product, there is uh, T cell receptor products uh, that are being looked at in solid tumors. Actually, maybe you could uh, discuss briefly uh, allogeneic cars and their promise, uh, uh, especially as a potential bridge to transplant in some patients. Yeah, I think in, uh, just very briefly, I think the allogeneic cars could, there's a lot of advantages, right? I mean, some of the obvious advantages are that it's ready to use. We don't have to wait for the manufacturing to happen and the manufacturing failure to happen. Um, as John was uh, 
referring to earlier patients who don't even get to Part D is obviously eliminates that. But the challenge with allogeneic CAR and also the CAR NK that came out of MD Anderson currently is the persistence and the efficacy of these. I, I think the toxicity with the CAR NK um, is fairly trivial, but the efficacy and the persistence of those cells currently remains a problem. The allogeneic CARs, we haven't seen um, any GVA problems such as GVH or anything that's unexpected. Um, and Khalid Sonber, one of our fellows, wrote a beautiful review on that last year. Um, but I think the persistence of those products uh, is something that, that will need to be seen. All right, looks like Abbas is gonna forfeit his question, so. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tanya. This was great. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.